The reason why we as a species emotionally revolt against ideas of functional predeterminism, like a block universe of time, or a will determined by the physical attributes of nature, is due to the ownership we wish to have over our identities. We don't like time dictating the cause and effect of our experience, just as we don't like to think that we're merely biological robots reacting to the biases of internal machinery. And yet, contrary to these long-held inner desires, the more naturalistic, physicalist concept of the self continues to rise in popularity every day. So let us in this chapter ask, what is it about the knowledge we have acquired from the scientific revolution that, for many, has disintegrated any stable hope of an eternal self? And even if it does turn out to be correct that we are mere biological machines with only an illusion of self, will this be the end of the road? Or can this as an idea take us somewhere new? Good morrow, fellow humans. My name is Sean, and I am obsessed with infinity. So join me as I attempt to unpick the infinities of what is. In 1924, towards the tail end of the technological revolution, German inventor and psychiatrist Hans Berger devised a method for unintrusively monitoring the brain's electrical activity. Across the following century, neuroscientists have increasingly devised studies that capitalise on the success of his invention, shedding light into the darkness of the mind with an ever-growing level of fidelity. The familiarly named EEG machine is the fairly necessary abbreviation for the considerable mouthful that is electroencephalography, which to me sounds more like a word from a Mary Poppins musical. Behind the eyes and the dark we'll see a hidden land that is you and me or he or she. The waves we be are electroencephalography. Yeah, or something like that. What the machine observes are the cycles of positive and negative electrical fluctuations that happen across the brain, which, like the frequencies used to describe sound waves and their associated rise or fall in pitch and volume, these brain waves correlate with the varied types and intensities of our conscious awareness. The five bandwidths described in this spectrum are the delta, theta, alpha, beta and gamma waves. Delta waves are the lowest frequencies, occurring between 0.1 and 3.5 hertz, and have been shown to increase during states of non-REM deep sleep. Theta waves fall between 4 and 8 hertz, and are associated with an at-rest state, such as daydreaming or meditation, and are thought to play a role in our creative thinking. Alpha waves, between 8 and 12 hertz, are associated with an at-ease, productive mental state. This is most common whenever a person is alert, but not actively processing information on a conscious level. Beta waves above 12 hertz are the dominant rate for an alert or anxious person with open eyes. Being at the more active end of the spectrum, these are further divided into a further subspectrum of low, mid and high beta waves capable of reaching above 18 hertz when subjects are in highly focused states. And lastly, above 30 hertz are the gamma waves. These occur when subjects are in their higher states of mental awareness, such as high-level information processing. It's also the only frequency that is found to happen across all parts of the brain. And so due to this, it has been hypothesized that the 40 hertz frequency is what may enable coherence a synchronisation of the brain that allows for its many regions to work as one in mentally demanding situations. We also get a very short gamma wave burst every time we have a significant sensory experience, 
such as biting into an apple or solving a problem, though these only tend to last for half a second. In a study conducted by neuroscientist Richard Davidson at the University of Wisconsin, 150 Olympic-level meditators from Nepal, India and France were invited to participate in a study of their brainwaves. These meditators, who required an average of 62,000 hours of meditation practice, showed previously unseen background levels of uninterrupted gamma waves. This frequency remained constant regardless of what the meditators were doing. And a further shock was revealed when their gamma wave intensity increased by 700 to 800 percent during their meditation sessions. A result that correlates perfectly with the ancient reports that meditation can evoke higher levels of experience. By removing the traditional stigmas historically associated with meditation, this 21st century scientific acknowledgement of meditation has more than normalised it among Westerners today, who barely blink at the idea of having a mindfulness app pre-installed in their latest smart device. And with ongoing support from the Dalai Lama, enthusiasm for such studies have only shown to grow. But where does all of this leave the idea of our higher spiritual self? As reassuring as these results are that meditation is effective, does it not also suggest that even our highest of spiritual experiences are nothing more than mere chemical reactions? That our experiences are nothing more than this mathematical signature of the universe? Could this clear correlation between physicality and experience be, in itself, enough to expel the idea that there may be some form of independent I? a deciding self who instead influences the physical attributes of the brain? Or is this yet another chicken and egg scenario? For if the mind is born of the brain, then it still seems evident that what the mind chooses to do will inadvertently have physical effects on the brain. By choosing to do certain things like meditation, do we shift the way the brain interprets input and thus our experience of reality? In short, just as the brain shapes the mind, does the mind shape the brain? A self-feedback loop where, for better or worse, what we practice becomes our reality. A fact perhaps all too familiar when considering the modern world and its traits of stress, anxiety and depression. But has it answered any of our questions? Yes, there is a clear correlation between experience and neuronal activity, but what, who or where is the I choosing to do the meditation in the first place? If the mind is rooted in the physical, what then is thought, and hence, what is the thinking self? An unexpected resurgence in psychedelic research has been opening up unique perspectives on the brain and how it may conjure our experience of self. In a recent study facilitated by the Berkeley Foundation, Professor Nutt and Robin Carhart Harris invited 20 volunteers to have their brain activity scanned during either a placebo or a 75 milligram dose of LSD. For those who took the LSD, the effects on the brain were astounding as the entire brain lit up like a city skyline, or perhaps more accurately, like a newborn baby's brain. Paths once determined by habitual practices and repeated experience appeared to be completely overridden, allowing parts of the brain once separated to be reconnected, resulting in the participants' ability to see their world, their problems, and their solutions totally anew. Other such studies are proving to show beyond anticipated success in treating cases of addiction, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and even cases of existential stress in end-of-life care. This simple chemical of nominal toxicity combined with an intentionally ceremonial setting had been enough to reset the software, giving rise to a new, less cluttered version of the self. Interestingly, Whilst there was an overall increase in brain connectivity, on certain occasions, a noticeable decrease could be seen to occur between two specific areas, the 
parahippocampus and the retrosplenial. Now, we don't need to remember these words, but they are fun to say. This lessening of connection often occurred during states of ego dissolution and, as such, seemed to indicate that this particular circuit may have something to do with our idea of self and the processing of what we experience as meaning. Though early evidence is encouraging, with more than 50 years' research blackout held in place since the drug wars of the mid-60s, there is still much to be done before this exciting field can catch up to its clinical counterparts. Side note. Since first researching this chapter in 2019, many countries have fast-tracked their acceptance of these therapeutic drugs. This occurring in Central Africa, specifically Equatorial Guinea, Cameroon, and the Republic of the Congo, South Africa, Australia, the Bahamas, Brazil, the British Virgin Islands, Canada, the Czech Republic, Costa Rica, Israel, Jamaica, Mexico, Nepal, the Netherlands, Panama, Peru, Portugal, Samoa, Spain, Switzerland, and the United States. Each offering varied degrees of decriminalization through to outright legalization. End side note. The underground research, however, has never subsided. In fact, it's been on the rise from decade to decade. Those who experiment with high doses of psychedelics such as LSD, psilocybin, DMT or ayahuasca often report that their most spiritually awakened experiences have been entwined with this disillusion of self known as ego death. Upon returning from such experiences, people often display long-lasting psychological changes akin to the life revelation seen in those who encounter a near-death experience. But similar to what we saw with the meditators, these, our highest ideals of purpose, meaning and spiritual enlightenment, those that humanity has allowed to influence its story since its earliest days, all appear to go hand in hand with the mere chemical reactions happening within the brain and the subsequent heightening or lowering of electrical frequencies. The evidence does seem to suggest that not only is the brain fundamental to the self, but that it is its totality. And in the face of such data, when uttered from the godly mouth of scientific investigation itself, it now seems obvious why recent generations have been retreating from once holy ideals. Though funnily, this physicalist philosophy is not always one shared by those self-proclaimed spiritually awakened psychonauts, nor the life meditators the inner peace they claim to find in such heightened moments of egolessness will scarcely be diminished by the rational explanation of the physical brain. And this is worth noting, as even though we may be able to show that our experience of self is intimately tied to the activity of the brain, the experience is still something that occurs. The experience must still be reckoned with as a phenomenon unto itself. Yes, the experience of thought and the micro-lightning storm of the brain clearly reflect the same underlying natural phenomena. But just as the physicality can be justified uniquely in measurement, so must the experience be acknowledged in and of itself as something more than the forces that allow it to exist. For it is this experience that we seek to understand. An experience that we so often try to grant value and meaning. But how is it that we give said meaning to an experience that we recognize to be rooted in physical construct? We endow the experience with the value we so desire by attaching to it our story of self. In doing this, we have entwined the lies of the brain and the impermanence of all physical structures with our fear of loss. The fear of losing one's story of self seems paramount to losing the experience itself. To not be me is to not exist. Yet, not only does consciousness dip in and out every evening as we sleep, but this self shifts constantly from moment to moment. And yet, most feel a need to hold on. What's intriguing about the heightened states of bliss and wholeness described in either of the two study groups 
is that their experiences often involve a loss of that self, a letting go of the identity in the story. Throughout the ages, a letting go of the ego has often been highlighted as a path towards enlightenment. But for the vast majority of us, for those unwilling to take on the risks of psychedelics or those unable to invest their precious time into a rigorous meditation practice, all we envision when we hear of such intense ego dissolution is a straightforward, unromantic loss of self a fall into the abyss, an endless, loveless darkness. Without the I, what am I? And boldly, here enters our fear of death. Why have we been so desperate to identify the I in the first place? It is because we know that one day it will be gone especially if we believe that the self exists purely within the physical. The desire to believe that some part of us may continue after our death is far from uncommon. Many may even wish for the scientific community to announce that consciousness is definitively not localised within the brain, since if that were to happen, perhaps we could justify some other, less fleeting plane of existence somewhere where our precious idea of self could happily live out eternity. The end of self is an idea that, once uncovered, fills every heart with an inherent dread. But what is the justification for this fear? Perhaps this fear is just a repercussion of our evolution. This would make sense. I mean, after all, wanting to survive seems like a pretty decent opening statement for a survival tactic. But how does this fear manifest itself? As a fear of the nothing, the yin to the yang of experience. Nothing. A topic we have touched on already in previous chapters. But let's say we could live on and never lose connection to that self, either in some form of spiritual afterlife an eternal earthbound body, or even something like a digital upload. In either case, we must still ask, who is it that gets to live on? Which version of you is it that gets access to eternity? As many of us will inevitably see out our final moments in quite sick and sorry states, some may take solace in the belief that upon leaving our bodies, we may be released as an unimpeded soul, with all senses reset to their prime. But if we assume some such mental reset, how far back would you go? Before the crippling disease took hold, or before the slow ageing process started getting in the way? How many different versions of you have there been? How many incarnations of you have already lived under your name in this one lifetime? And how many of those would jostle for the prime position of eternity? I'm pretty sure your teenage self would like to have a crack. Maybe the you that gains entrance to eternity is you at your happiest. But what does this say for every other emotion you have ever experienced? Were they less you? The religious argument is that this is heaven a perfect eternal bliss. Obviously, you will be the you that you wish to be and more. But this reasoning doesn't help us to define or clarify anything. You will be the you that you wish to be. I, for one, am still yet to be satisfied as to what this you is. Or maybe you might consider this completely irrelevant as you do not believe in any such afterlife. That may be, but... The intention is not to determine whether there is an afterlife. The intention is to determine what it is that we are each so afraid to lose upon our death. For if we can answer this, perhaps we shall be able to answer our question regarding the nature of self. As discussed across previous chapters, the self shifts constantly throughout the marathon of life 
with the torch of identity passed many times. As shown in both cases of the meditators and psychonauts, any influence, self-induced or otherwise, can completely rewrite both the physical brain and the internal experience of self. The question now is, can a newer, evolved incarnation of that self still be considered the same entity as that which came before? And if so, what's the line? How deteriorated, or for that matter, how improved can our brains become before the original self is overwritten? Here, once more, we seek the blurry mirage of universal borders. So let us, in the next chapter, in our attempts and efforts to find something tangible, let us look at the myriad of ways in which a self can be interrupted by the physical, and then let us further dissect what this tells us about the self of our experience. What an amazing fortnight we have had. There's been so many amazing uh, conversations and discussions happening in the comments section over the last few episodes. And it's really been lovely to engage with you on that level uh, and to share these ideas with you. I know that a lot of people who are into these sort of ideas, who like to discuss the deeper riddles of what reality is, find it hard to find their people. And are usually surprised how many people are out there really just don't want to talk about these things. <clears throat> so this channel is for us. This channel is for us to be able to have those conversations, to challenge our own ideas, to go into these ideas uh, without any fear or judgment and just really just play with them to the point of, of seeing where they break. And um, I hope that you're as inspired by these conversations as I am and I hope that they continue. I don't ask for people to like and subscribe on this channel. I just ask that we engage with each other, jump in the comment section and at very least have a look at some of the comments and just give it a thumbs up. Comment on uh, other people's comments. That would be just really great to see that sort of back and forth happening. Thank you to the repeating faces and uh, yeah, I'm going to leave you now. I'll see you in about a fortnight's time. Much love. I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful week.